Let's talk about Christmas movies. George Bailey, my man. If you haven't seen It's a Wonderful Life, I am not going to spoil it for you, but I am going to tell you why I cry every single time. I just can't make it. Anybody with me on this one? It just gets me. George Bailey is kind of this every man, hometown hero, all around good guy. He wants to honor his dad's legacy by preserving the family business. He tries to serve and support his wife by buying this romantic old house. Loves his kids as the next generation of Baileys growing up in Bedford Falls. And all through the first half of the movie, though, there's this like kind of like simmering tension. George watches as his friends go off and make the big money, drive the nice cars. George sends his younger brother off to college while he holds down the fort at home. He sacrifices his own honeymoon savings to save Bedford Falls in a stock market crash. His dreams dissipate, his hopes evaporate, and the momentum of life just kind of moves him along. We feel this invisible but inevitable storm brewing beneath George's charming, winsome, warming smile. And then about halfway through the movie, there's this scene where George just has this really terrible day at work. I'm not going to blow it for you, but it's this catastrophic, pitiful point in the movie where his character just cracks, and it looks like this. The dam just breaks open, and everything that was held back just spills out, and George just loses it. Oh, doggone it, Mr. Potter. Families, why are the families coming? Oh, does he have to keep playing? He just like loses everything. He starts kicking presents around. And it's this scene, I think, that we really get because from the comfort of our couches, we're sitting there going, dang, George, you just did the one thing that all of us are most afraid of. You dropped the filter. You let it all out. You showed us your real self, and it was not very pretty. (laughs) It's this remarkable moment of convergence where the George in here finally overtakes the George out here. And as combustible as that moment is, it's this moment of peaceless convergence (laughs) that defines the story. Peace. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Prince of Peace. Have you ever noticed that you cannot fake peace for very long? You can slap a smile on for a little while, but you can't fake it. Not for very long. This is our fourth and final week in our Advent teaching series called The Name. Four titles, four ideas lifted right from Isaiah 9. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of peace. And with the first three, you're like, there's really not a whole lot of argument. Of course God's a wonderful, mighty, everlasting, like he's God, right? But whether you're George Bailey in Bedford Falls or the rest of us with our own stuff that we're carting around through life, it's that last one kind of makes us raise our eyebrows a little bit. It's the most personal, I think. Peace. If he's really peace, why don't I have it all the time? Peace. So often the out here doesn't match the in here. Speaking pers- personally for me, I don't want just a peaceful face. I want a peaceful heart. And I wonder if you might be the same way. So here's where we're going today. Just kind of two parts. First, we're going to talk about what this title means out of Isaiah 9, Prince of Peace. And then we're going to talk about what It has to do with us. We're going to talk about what this title means, what peace is and what it is not. And then we're going to look to the New Testament and say, okay, well, how do we actually live as people of peace in a very divided world? So Isaiah 9, let's just get there. You can turn there, flip there, scroll there. You could watch behind. Here's what Isaiah says as he looks out on his version of Bedford Falls. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, 
He brought into contempt the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. I know we don't know what those are. <laughs> but in the latter time, he's made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. This is his world that he's talking about. And then he just explodes in poetry. The people who've walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You've increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad as when they divide the spoil. Why? For the yoke of his burden, the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as in the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in the battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. As if to say, we're not going to need that stuff anymore. Why? For to us a son is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called, and here they come, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Of the increase of his government and his peace, there will be no end on the throne of David over his kingdom to establish and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Wow, what a picture. <laughs> it's fitting that Prince of Peace should come at the end of all four of these titles because it's the climactic one. It's when the wave finally crashes and crests. This is the symbol crash at the end of a giant crescendo. It's the exclamation point of a sentence. It's the realization of what these first three titles have promised. So this coming king is wonderful and mighty and everlasting to what end. Why is he all those things? What's he going to be? What's he going to do? What is he going to work to accomplish? And then like the other three titles, this one is like a smash up of two words that just are like glued together. First one, prince. Prince. This one kind of lands a little oddly on our ears because when we think of prince, we think of the guy who will be king but isn't king yet, right? Like we kind of like didn't expect that one. Prince, hang on a minute. There's a diminutive feeling to this idea of prince that might unconsciously skew our perception or our understanding of who this person is. His crown isn't quite as big. His reach isn't quite as far. His roar isn't quite as loud. This prince. But this junior bacon cheeseburger version of prince or side salad if you're trying to get a head start on January. That's not what this is about. This isn't someone less than. A few quick details about this picture. First, the word prince is used 422 times in the Old Testament. It's all over the place. Literally translates as the full representation of the king. Everything the king is, this person is. 175 of those times, it's translated as commander. 136 times, it's translated as official. It's also translated as ruler, leader, or interestingly, a ruling being whose powers originate from outside this world. That's interesting. This is somebody who commands armies. This is someone who points and things happen. This is someone whose words have otherworldly weight. He speaks with authority. He leads with integrity. He guides with ability. And so there's no reason to think that this prince is somehow less than. Kind of begs the question, though. Well, why is he worth following? And that's the second word. Peace. Peace. Everything he does is characterized by peace. This is important. He isn't just peaceful. This isn't just an adjective. He isn't just nice, kind, good, like just kind of chill, peace. That's not who we're talking about here. Peace is both his goal, also his person. He makes peace because he is peace. Peace isn't a bullet point on his agenda. It's part of who he is. It's everything he is about. Now, we like this idea of peace, don't we? Is anybody not for peace? No? We love this idea. But as it turns out, peace is something that's really hard to define. If you have 100 people in a room and you ask them, what is peace, you're going to get 100 different answers. 
Webster's Dictionary gives us two definitions. The first one is the cessation of hostilities, means that fighting is over. Sounds good. Second definition in Webster's is something like inner peace, or this idea of like peace of mind, calm. Also, sounds good. Eastern Zen mystics promise peace through meditation and other things. What they really mean is serenity. Your neighbor wants peace from your barking dog. At least my neighbor probably does. What he really wants is quiet. <laughs> the patient in the hospital wants peace to know that they're going to be okay. What they really want is healing. The troubled marriage wants peace to know that they're going to get through it okay. What they really want is assurance. Here's the insight. Peace is loosely defined as the condition of life that we all know should be. And in most cases, we only know peace by its absence. We only know it when we don't have it. Or you could say we only know it because we don't have it. Something isn't right. We're going to learn a little Hebrew this morning. You ready? The Hebrew word for peace, some of you know this already, is shalom. Shalom. There you go. The Hebrew word shalom is this deeply rich, theologically awesome word. It means that everything that was fractured is now mended. Shalom means that everything that was broken is now restored. Everything lost is now found. Everything that you know shouldn't be is now made right. Now, take that idea of shalom. Shalom, God's peace. And if we follow this thread of peace through Isaiah, it leads to some really interesting places. First off, Isaiah 2, 4, it shows up again. This prince will put an end to physical war. Here's what he says in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4. He shall judge between the nations, and he shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. This idea shows up here. All of a sudden, these things that were used as weapons of war will become harvesting tools. It's amazing. He'll put an end to worldly animosity. This is Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6. This is beautiful. He's got a bunch of things he just lines up here. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6. The wolf shall lie down with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion will be, and the fattened calf together. And a little child shall lead them. That's an interesting insight. Verse 7, though, he continues. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. He keeps going. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra. Anybody want to do that? Huh. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah 53 also has one. This is interesting to me. Probably the most interesting. Somehow, somehow, we will enjoy this king's peace through his suffering. Isaiah 53, verse 5. Take a look at this one. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us, what? Peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. That's interesting. So let's smash these two ideas together. Prince of Peace. If you had to build it out, here's the idea. This is a one-day king, still far off, yet to come, who will take authoritative initiative to establish shalom for God's people in a way that we cannot do for ourselves. One commentator put it like this. I'd say it better, but I think they say it quite well. This is a peaceful king. One who comes in peace and one who establishes peace, not by brutal squashing of all defiance, but by means of a transparent vulnerability which makes defiance pointless. And then the part that I love the best. Somehow through him will come the reconciliation between God and man that will make possible reconciliation between man and man. So that's Isaiah. 
That's what this title means. Before we move into the New Testament, Isaiah is about 700, 760 BC, somewhere around in there. I want to just move like one rest stop further in the timeline of history. I want to go like about 600 BC. 600 BC, there's another prophet called Jeremiah who talks about peace. It's been a hundred years or so since God's people have heard these words from Isaiah. There's a gap. A hundred years since wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. A hundred years since God's people heard this news about a coming king. And a hundred years is a long time to wait for someone. Here's what's going on in the hundred years since Isaiah. The kingdom of Israel is more divided than ever. Neighboring kingdoms are creating profound economic instability for God's people. You've got hyper-nationalism, cultural paranoia, conspiracy theories, and competing opinions. Does any of that sound familiar to you at all? So what do God's people do? God's people do in Jeremiah's time what we always do. (laughs) We get restless and we go, where is this king? Come on. And we start looking for ways to make the wound of anti-shalom a little more bearable. So what do they do? They hire prophets to tell them exactly what they want to hear. They raise up kings to tell them what they want to hear and make them feel a little more secure. And they provide all these solutions for themselves just to distract from the pain of life. And here's the thing. Those tactics actually kind of work for a while. They work, kind of. But they're like band-aids and balms that mask the real problem. So after Isaiah, God raises up this prophet named Jeremiah. Here's what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 6, verse 14. This to me is one of the most profound verses in the Old Testament. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Translation, that emptiness and frustration that you feel, that absence of shalom, that something is not right, that deep feeling, what that's called is sin and rebellion, and we're all steeped in in it. Give me enough time, I'm going to make a mess of my life. And I can't get rid of it by covering it up with a band-aid. Jeremiah's point is beware of false assurances, shallow diagnoses, and quick fixes. The charge, they have healed the wound of my people lightly. What he means by that is I don't need a Band-Aid, I don't need a balm, I don't need to treat the symptoms, I need something that's going to treat the cause. I need something that's going to work in the dark places, not easily seen. I need someone who's going to change me from the inside out. And so Jeremiah's cautionary, slow down, wait a minute word, is essentially this. Why work so hard? Perfecting the band-aid when all it does is mask the wound. If you want peace, why waste time treating the symptoms when doing so only dulls our sensitivity? Why point to something that doesn't make a lasting difference? North Can Chapel, I hope you hear me because I'm trying to be both direct and delicate. (laughs) Then as now... We live in an age of a thousand and one false messiahs, and you can put anything you want in that blank. Politicians and notions, movements and motions, whatever you want to throw in that gap of your life that promises peace. Each one promising a version of peace, each one profoundly unable to actually give it, each one distracting from the real problem, denying its severity, and delaying its healing. Please, please hear me. Now as then, the short-term treatment we want is actually preventing the long-term healing that we need. 
treating the wound lightly. Band-aids and balms in place of real shalom. The Prince of Peace is coming. And he alone is able to treat the wound. Accept no substitutes. Now, let's ease out on the rest stop of history and get back on the road. <laughs> After six more centuries of silence, it had to be cold for them that night out there under Father Abraham's stars. There's just a handful of them doing what they had always done night after night for generations. They were tending sheep on familiar hillsides. And then come the words that broke through the quietness. Luke chapter 2 verse 14 says this, glory to God in the highest and on earth what? Peace. <laughs> among those with whom he is pleased. Those are not just great words for Christmas cards. They are not just nice dialogue for Linus's little spotlight speech. <laughs> that word, peace is here, that is the scroll of prophecy unwinding through time and landing finishing here. Mary understood it. Here's how she said it. Luke chapter 1, verse 54. She would put it like this. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Simeon, who was a priest in the temple that night, put it like this. He said, my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light of revelation. Do you hear Isaiah 9 in there? A light for those that dwell in darkness. A light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Zechariah, who got even more specific when he said that this baby would, in verse 77, give knowledge of salvation, by the way, that's the word Yeshua, Jesus, to his people and forgiveness of their sins. Why? Because of the tender mercy of God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet to the way of, help me, peace. Whatever you believe happened on Christmas Eve, God's word says that this baby would go way beyond band-aids and balms. That this baby born in the fullness of time is God's shalom born. Now that's the claim anyway. Let's get specific. How is Jesus the Prince of Peace? What does that really mean? God's word actually talks about three different kinds of peace that we experience or we can experience. And they're the three kinds of peace that I think elude a lot of us. First off, there's peace with God. Then there's the peace of God. And then there's peace with others. And we could like stop there and just take like a minute just to think on that because at the risk of sounding overly simplistic, I really do think when you look out in our world, and when I look inwardly in myself, every sense of unrest, every anti-shalom that I bump into or that I even create for myself can be boiled down to one of those three things. Peace with God, peace of God, and then peace with others. Thomas Merton, who's a 20th century Trappist monk, put it this way. We are not at peace with others because we are not at peace with ourselves. We are not at peace with ourselves because we are not at peace with God. I wonder if you agree with him. I do, 100%. God's word teaches not only are all three of those kinds of peace linked together, but all three of those kinds of peace are met in Christ's Alone, And so I want to spend the next 13 minutes or so this morning asking if we are created to enjoy peace with God, the peace of God, and peace with others, how exactly does Jesus do that? Because it's one thing to just say, eh, Prince of Peace. What does that even mean? He 
Here is Paul's answer. I want to invite you to Ephesians chapter 2. Because this idea of peace skims across the surface of history and it plops in Ephesians chapter 2 in some really powerful ways. Embedded in this text are four ways that Jesus is our Prince of Peace. I want to start, though, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Here's what he says. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh. Now we're going to get oddly biological here for a second, so bear with me. Most of us here, I imagine, are ethnically Gentile. That means we're not Jewish. And this is a big deal in the New Testament, in the early church. Here's what he says. You Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. That was a way of denoting who was in and who was out. Who's good and who's bad. Who's God's people and who's not. Remember that you at one time were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And this is truth number one. We got to start here. There is no hope for peace without Jesus. So these words that are in verse 12, maybe you caught them, separated, alienated, no hope without God, strangers. That's who we are without Christ. Here's why this matters. It doesn't matter if you're Jewish or Gentile, male or female, rich or poor, no matter your ethnic identity, your family heritage, your cultural background, every person ever created knows the feeling of unpeace, anti-shalom, the brokenness of world. And all Paul's doing is naming it here. He says the real problem, people, is that money That's not the real problem. The real problem isn't leaders. It isn't culture. It isn't whatever else I want to fill in that gap. Paul takes the problem of unpeace and he expresses it in terms of distance. The problem is we are far from God. And I don't think we can minimize this. Like not far from God, like, oh, it would be nicer to be close to God. Like far from God, like I can't find my way back on my own. I've messed my life up too much. I've got too much stuff in the closet that I don't want to let anybody know. And it forces me to live in a place of unpeace, profound tension. I've got a peace problem that I can't resolve. I need a peace bringer and I'm not him. (laughs) Hear me on this. Before we move, what you propose to a solution, as a solution to the problem is very important. The solution that you propose to whatever problem is afflicting you is super important because it inevitably becomes what you worship. Theologian D.A. Carson, in his book, A Call to Spiritual Reformation, gives us this oft-quoted insight. I'm going to read it because I love it. Here's what he says. If God had perceived that our greatest need was economic, he would have sent us an economist. If he had perceived that our greatest need was entertainment, he would have sent us a comedian or an artist. If God had perceived that our greatest need was political stability, he would have sent us a politician. If he had perceived that our greatest need was health, he would have sent us a doctor. But he perceived that our greatest need involved our sin, our alienation from him, our profound rebellion, our death, and so he sent us a savior. Guys, let's never lose sight of this. The solution you propose to man's problem is very important. So this is truth number one. We've got to just start here, that there's no hope for peace without Christ. But then, mercifully, Paul continues with the words, but now. Take a look in verse 13. He says, but now, in Christ Jesus. Do you hear it just like kind of turn? Those of you, us, who were once far off, have been brought near. How, Paul, how? By the blood of Christ. And here's truth number two. Only Jesus cancels sin's curse. There's so much theology in this verse, it's ridiculous. But simply, here's Paul's point. 
On the cross, Jesus achieved my peace with God by paying my sin debt. Another one of my great favorite theologians, J.I. Packer, puts it this way. The Christmas message is that there is hope for ruined humanity, hope for pardon, hope for peace with God, hope for glory, because at the Father's will, Jesus became poor and was born in a stable so that 30 years later he may hang on a cross. Practically, let's chase this forward. Any notion of peace that requires anything other than Jesus is idolatry. And that's a really strong statement, so let me tease this out so you know what I'm talking about before I wildly offend everybody in the room. I love fly fishing. It's like my hobby. It's just my thing. I love it. But if I need it to have peace, I am an idolater. I love my morning coffee. Well, coffees, who am I kidding? It's plural. I love them. But if I need it before I can experience peace, mm -mm. let me push this a little closer. If I need my world to look a certain way, act a certain way, function a certain way, believe a certain thing, if I need the right king on the throne of my world before I can experience peace, if I need the circumstances of my life to be something before I can experience peace, I will never find the peace that God wants for me. Now, I can want those things. I can pray for those things. I can enjoy those things. I can pursue those things. I can talk about those things. I can even work to achieve those things. I just can't need those things. My peace can never be dependent on them for its survival. If peace can only be achieved when it's Jesus plus whatever, or if peace can only happen if I can prop up Jesus with something else, or I can only have peace when I got Jesus in this hand and something else in this hand, I am a subtle idolater treating the wound lightly. Band-aids and balms. Here's why this is important. Do you want to know what a cynical and suspicious world is watching for? To see if Christians really mean it when we say Christ alone. Now, I know we mean it for salvation. I think you're probably there. Christ alone for salvation. But do we really mean it for life? Do we really mean it when we say he is our peace? watching to see if when we say, yes, Christ is enough for me, we still reach for something else. I think one of the deepest questions you could ask, and Christmas is a great time to reflect on it. It's a tough question, but let me ask it. Is Jesus enough for you? Really? Like, is the hope of heaven, God and sinner reconciled, hell canceled, heaven guaranteed, is that really enough, or am I still hoping for something more? When the Father sent the Son and said, here, this is, He is my peace for you. He did not hold anything back that you would need. Truth number three. Only Jesus obliterates worldly division. And now this is where Paul gets ready to make a few enemies, and it's where I like it. Verse 14. He says, For he himself is our peace. What has he done? He's made us both one, us, both. What's he talking about? We'll get to this. He's broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances. We'll get to this in a minute. That he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, making what? Peace. He might reconcile us both to God in one body, through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, Gentiles, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Now here's what Paul is doing here. One of the biggest issues in the early church, like we said, was the dividing line between Jews and Gentiles. And Paul imagines this division as two different people completely. 
This image of a dividing wall is an actual literal wall in the temple in Jerusalem. It's a wall about three feet high called the Soric Wall. And it was the wall beyond which only Jewish people could pass. If you can, you're in. If you can't go past there, you're out. Somehow substandard. And Paul's conclusion here is that because of Christ's work on the cross, that wall is blown up three times in five verses. He says, you're both one, verse 14. You're one new man, verse 15. One body, verse 16. Translation, what Christ did on the cross redefines who you are in this world. Do you hear the distant echo of Isaiah 11 in there? We read them a little bit ago, wolves and lambs and lions and calves, enemies in this life playing together in the next life. Here's the principle. Only Jesus obliterates worldly divisions. And some of you see where this is going, so let's just walk through this door. I believe that one of the most daunting tasks for the American church in 2023 will also be our greatest opportunity. I think we need to relearn how to love people with whom we disagree. We are really good at loving people who are just like us, aren't we? (laughs) But we struggle, don't we, with learning how not to tolerate people who are different. Or do we disagree? But to love them. If I said, hey, good news, God tolerates you. That's borderline sociopathic behavior. But if I said, good news, God loves you. (laughs) That's a little bit different story. We've been taught to treat people as though our closeness with them should somehow be tied to political affiliations and Facebook posts and personal opinions about passing issues. We are so quick to look down our nose at people and dismiss them as contemptible or to see them as the enemy or to label them as stupid. Guys, that is how the world works. And if you let me push this further, if we choose to join in on that, I believe we are actually undoing the shalom that Jesus seeks to accomplish. We are Christians. We do have an enemy, but only one. Everybody else is an image bearer intentionally, infinitely, intimately loved by God. And if in Christ, God has saw fit to forgive someone, I have no permission to treat them as though he hasn't. I feel like I need to get specific, because I can. Just for a minute, just for a bit. No one goes to heaven as a Democrat or a Republican. No one enters heaven as a conservative or a liberal. No one goes to heaven by any of the paltry, worldly definitions we want to stick on people here. Anyone who ever enters heaven enters by one identity, blood-bought worshiper of Jesus. And here's the point. The only identity you have there is the only one that matters here. Can you imagine what a divided world would do with a unified church A church that courageously pursues peace like no one else can by kicking worldly definitions, designations, and divisions to the curb in favor of heavenly identities. Could you imagine that? I know you're saying that's naive, idealistic, and simplistic, but I think it's possible. I am tired of the divisiveness of our world. I think you probably are too but I am heartbroken from the expectation that the church should join it. And church, I think this could be our great gift to our world in these days to pursue gospel peace by choosing to love those with whom we disagree. Jesus obliterates worldly divisions. Then, Last point. It's like Paul imagines Jesus taking the stones from that blown up dividing wall and then building something new and beautiful. Here's what he says in verse 19. He says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens. Those words sound familiar? That's where we were just a couple verses ago. But you are fellow citizens of the saints and members of the household of God. And he imagines this building happening all of a sudden. These strewn about boulders. 
built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And here's truth number four. Only Jesus builds what lasts. One of my favorite Christmas traditions that we're going to do here at North Canton Chapel, and I don't want to sound heavy-handed, but as long as I get to be lead pastor, which I hope is a very, very long time, we're going to do this every Christmas Eve because it's one of my favorite things in the world. Every Christmas Eve, we sing Silent Night together, and it's quiet and it's soft, and it's just a piano and it's vocals. And we do what is commonly called passing the light. Some of you guys know what that is. The light's dim, and we light candles. And not like the fake battery-operated ones either. That's cheating. (laughs) We tip unlit candles onto lit candles one by one, and it starts small, and it works through the aisles until this, like, whole room just glows. We get to do this together this Saturday night. It's this beautiful, holy moment, my favorite, really, of the year, where we celebrate Jesus, the light of the world. But I think there's another message in that, too, Because Jesus, who is the light of the world, then turns that inside out and says, you, you go do this. I think that in these divisive days, with so many looking for peace, passing the light is a reminder that we're connected to something beautiful. We're connected to something much bigger than each of us are. Something that Jesus is building, his church. The soft, unsaid message in that moment seems to be that our prince has not left us alone in this world. That our prince has given us the gift of himself, but he's also given us the gift of each other. Hmm. If I lived in Bedford Falls, I'd like to buy George Bailey a cup of coffee. I kind of feel like he'd be my guy. This isn't too cheesy. I wonder if you know a George Bailey. I wonder if you are a George Bailey. (laughs) Do you know the Prince of Peace? Do you know him? Do you know anybody who needs to know him? Hmm. Let's pray. Our Father, we can come to you knowing that your heart is for our peace. And yet, just like the song says, we look around and it seems like hate mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Father, show us how to live in this shalom that you have started in Christ. God, give us courage in these days. Our world does not know peace, does not know how to achieve peace. So Lord, help us to celebrate what you and you alone are capable of giving us. We say thank you for this baby born in a manger and the Savior who hung on a cross. Father, we love you. In Christ's name we pray, amen.